And David goes, that jerk should die. And then Nathan, it's the best singer, he goes, you're the man. You're the man. You're that guy that you hated. You saw it so clearly for a second. You're the man. The man you're so angry at is yourself. Now, to David's credit, how does he respond to this conviction? He says, I have sinned. He immediately repents. So our reading is from the second book of, prof of the prophet Samuel, chapter 12, verses 1 through 25 which you can find beginning on page 484 in your pew Bibles. Listen to the word of God. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little... I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household... I am going to bring calamity on you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to the one who is close to you, and he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, The Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. But because by doing this you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, the son born to you will die. After Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife had born to David, and he became ill. David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted and spent the nights lying in sackcloth on the ground. The elders of his household stood beside him to get him up from the ground, but he refused, and he would not eat any food with them. On the seventh day, the child died. David's attendants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they thought, while the child was still living, he wouldn't listen to us when we spoke to him. How can we now tell him the child is dead? He may do something desperate. David noticed that his attendants were whispering among themselves, and he realized the child was dead. Is the child dead, he asked. Yes, they replied, he is dead. Then David got up from the ground. After he had washed, put on lotions, and changed his clothes, he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he went to his own house, and at his request they served him food, and he ate. His, attend his attendants asked him, Why are you acting this way? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept. But now that the child is dead, you get up and eat. He answered, While the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. I thought, who, know, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that he is dead, why should I go on fasting? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. Then David comforted his wife Bathsheba, and he went to her and made love to her. She gave birth to a son, and they named him Solomon. The Lord loved him. And because the Lord loved him, he sent word through Nathan the prophet, to name him Jedediah, the word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. One of the reasons that um, a lot of people insist that the Revised Common Lectionary needs to be followed, it's, it's a series of four readings every Sunday. Over the course of three years, you cover a lot of the Bible. But one of the reasons people think it's pretty important is because it's going to make sure that every preacher preaches on texts that they don't really want to preach on. You know, if, if I was in charge, I would not preach on uh, a text where God's justice for David is killing an innocent baby. And there's some people who'd correct me and say, hey, 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 Jeffrey, God didn't kill an innocent baby because babies are not born innocent. We're all born with Adam's sin upon us and worthy of death and destruction. And I'm there doctrinally, but I'm not there personally. I'm just not. Um, and maybe I'm wrong, you know, and if so, God needs to correct me. But um, I'm a father of three children, and with all three children, I've been very anxious about, you know, I heard a stat a while back that uh, about one in 12 children don't even come to term. Uh, whenever a woman conceives and becomes pregnant, I do believe that that is a new person right there. Uh, several years ago, there was a, a survey taken of uh, biologists in colleges asking when does uh, a person become a person, a, a unique organism, and 99% said when a male gamete combines with a female ga gamete, sperm, egg, that's when there is a new cre uh, creation, a new creature. And I firmly believe that. I believe it because my heart tells me so. I believe it because um, throughout the scriptures, pre-born children are still considered children. They're not considered some growth in the mother's belly. They are considered people made in God's image. And um, this, this child was already born, but had not seen the fullness of life, was a newborn baby. Uh, but because of what David did, God said, you deserve some punishment, and part of it's going to be that this baby dies. And I don't like that very much. I don't like that at all, because I've had three babies, and I imagine what it would be like for them to suffer for my sins, and that just puts my spirit in agony. I would hate for my children to suffer for my sins. Um, this is a question that the Bible throughout the Old Testament deals with pretty explicitly. Do children suffer for the sins of their parents? And in some places, the answer seems to be yes. And in other places, like Ezekiel, he says outright, no, fathers will not pay the price for their son's sins, and sons will not pay the price for their father's sins. It's one of these things, you know, some people will just get real silly about it and just say, well, there's a contradiction here. We just get to make up our own minds. And I don't think that's why the Bible kind of speaks out of both sides of its mouth. I believe that we're, this is a question we're supposed to be anxious about. Because we all are born of people that are sinners. And if you've looked at yourself, you, you ever look in the mirror and go, oh, I see my father. I see that. I look at my feet. I have my father's feet. I didn't used to. I do now. And as I speak to my children gruffly sometimes, I go, man, my dad used to speak to me that way. There are ways that we relive our parents' lives, and if we're not careful, we'll repeat their errors. A lot of us are aware of people whose, whose parents were just terrible alcoholics. And some people, they look at their parents and go, I'm never going to have a sip of alcohol. But you'll see other kids go through the exact same thing, do the exact same things to their kids that were done unto them. And that's how we are with sin. Sin has terrible hold on us, especially when it's all we've ever known. So, I mean, this can be a conversation about the sins of the father being visited upon the children. In theory, yes, our sins are passed along. We learn our sins from our parents. It's, it's very hard to shake loose of those sins. But you're still just not going to get me past this place where a baby had to die because of someone else's sins. I can't do it. I can't give the sermon where God does only good things and God killed that baby, so killing a baby is a good thing. I can have the conversation where something good comes out of it, but that doesn't mean the evil thing that happened is good because something good came out of it. I can't call something evil good. I can't call something good evil. And the death of a baby for a sin that the baby did not, did not commit, I cannot call good. So this is, this is probably the one place that you're ever going to see me just go, I, I can't go with where the Bible's leading me right now. And it's probably wrong for me to be up here preaching on, hey, I just can't go where the Bible's leading me right here. That's probably malpractice here, and please forgive me. My hope is, as I, as I share this with you, that your understanding, whenever I get up here every other Sunday and I preach the Bible is the truth and we need to trust in the Bible and we need to obey the Bible, it's one thing if you think, oh, he's just a simpleton who already agrees with everything in there anyway. That way you can write me off. 
But what if the pastor who's preaching at you and encouraging you is one who, who has really struggled and suffered with the Bible and had a terrible, tremendous time conforming my life to the Word of God? And as I've done so, it's been wonderful. I love giving that sermon. But it's really hard giving a sermon on, here's a God who played a role in the death of this baby. I, I, I've been spending all week trying to figure out a way to spin it so we could all feel good about it. Can't feel good about babies dying. Let's talk about the wisdom in this passage, shall we? Begins with the prophet Nathan coming to David and spinning a yarn about a rich man who had plenty of animals, had a neighbor who had on just one little ewe lamb and he was poor. Rich man has a visitor come. They want to eat some meat. Rather than killing one of his many animals, he steals his neighbor's ewe lamb whom he loved and they eat that thing, and David goes, that jerk should die. And then Nathan, it's the best singer, he goes, you're the man. You're the man. You're that guy that you hated. You saw it so clearly for a second. You're the man. The man you're so angry at is yourself. Now, to David's credit, how does he respond to this conviction? He says, I have sinned. He immediately repents. Anybody here have a hard time repenting whenever you've been discovered as a sinner? Honey, you said you were going to wash the dishes. It's time for bed now, and there's dirty dishes in the sink. Well, you shouldn't have made me do this other thing, and I forgot about it. It's your fault, not mine. That's just a simple thing, you know, who cares about washing the dishes. But how many of us, whenever we're forced to look at a failing of ours, go, it's somebody else's fault. You're holding me to a bad standard. You're wrong to call me out. And this just so happens, we're talking about it in the church, and what we're going to hear about uh, with our New Testament reading is, in the church, we are responsible to one another for helping one another grow in holiness, and that happens as we name each other's sin. What Nathan did to David here, making up this story and then putting David in the bad person's role and making him hate himself, is that a loving thing to do or a hateful thing to do? It's a loving thing to do. Because how many of us are self-interested? Raise your hand or you're a liar. We are self-interested. We are. We hate. It does not feel good to be guilty. It does not feel good to be the bad guy. And yet, if we look at ourselves soberly in the mirror and we see our sin for what it is, it is ugly, it is detestable, it is worthy of judgment and condemnation. And it's only when we see ourselves for how ugly we are that we get to receive Christ for how beautiful he is. And the fact that he chooses to love us despite our unworthiness. That he chooses to forgive us despite our nastiness. And what Nathan does here, he condemns David, even as David is, is repenting in his heart. He says, the Lord says, I gave you all this stuff. I gave you the kingdoms. I gave you all your wealth. I gave you all your power. I would have given you even more. And what's your rewarding? What do you do to, to pay me back? You sin. You kill Uriah. You have an affair with this woman. And then, fine. How many, most of us haven't killed somebody. I would like to think most of us have not slept with a married person that we're not married to. But even if we haven't done those things, how many people here know that God has given you far more blessing than you could ever deserve? And then how many of us have persisted in sin? There's something scandalous about that. When we come to understand how unworthy we are and how much God has blessed us, we don't have to be kings to know we're blessed. God has given you and me so much more than we deserve, and yet we reward him by just waking up every morning and continuing in sin and not even feeling bad about it most of the time. Not even having the decency to feel bad about it most of the time. David, I don't like David. I'll be honest with you. I, just, I read every story about him. I do not identify with David, especially as he's like fasting for his child while he's still alive, and then the child dies, and then he just gets dressed and takes a shower and has a meal and he's feeling, what's the point? You know, I don't identify with that at all, okay? But even so, what you have to acknowledge about King David is he had the decency to re repent and admit when he was wrong. Most men in particular, but women too, are too proud to repent. Well, I've done it and it might not have been right, but I'm not going to regret it now. I've, that's what I've done. And that is the wrong way to be. David, who was a king, instantly, I, I have sinned, I repent, I'm sorry, Lord, please forgive me. And when the child dies, what a thing. The first thing he does, he goes to the temple and he worships God. It reminds me of Job. Job, if you know his story, all his children get killed. Oh, what an overlap. 
his immediate reaction. Even though he's sad, even though his whole world has fallen apart, he immediately bows and worships God. He said, I worshiped him in days of good and plenty. I can't worship him whenever things go wrong. God is still God. That message is so mature. Sometimes I feel like I'm a mature Christian, and other times I feel like a baby Christian. Learning to praise God when I am suffering, when life is hard, when I have experienced loss. This is a mature thing. I find it so easy to praise God when he's given me all this stuff and life is good. How many of us praise God when life is not good? When I am broken? When I feel lost? But that's the model. That's the model David gives. That's the model Job gives. And that's the model Jesus gives. Up on the cross, he's not cursing God. He's praising God. And that's the model set for us. How many of you know that in your future lies great suffering? I know in my future lies great suffering. I know it. Statistically, it's inevitable. Even though the Lord loves me, I'm going to have some really hard days ahead. And the test in those days will be, will I praise God then as I do now? Or am I a fair weather friend that only praises God when he's given me what I want? David here the, the, the moral of the story is not David was perfect and we should all be like David. The moral is David deserved punishment as we deserve punishment. God was good to him despite his unworthiness, just like he is to us. And our role is to mourn our sins, repent, and glorify God in good seasons and bad. Can we say amen to that?